Well, hello there. And a really warm welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sharon Mark Taggart, and I am the co-founder and one of the directors of the Curious Piano Teachers. And in just a moment, I'm going to be bringing on Dr. Sally Cathcart, our other co-founder. But I have the huge privilege today of introducing Joanne Strong. And it's so exciting because today uh, we are in June's home, um, just off the Willow Road in Belfast. So uh, you can see here in the background um, is her very beautiful Steinway piano. So let me just get Sally on the call here and from there we are going to get going. So let me just get Sally. <clears throat> And there we go. Hello, Sally. Hello there, everybody. Okay, hi. <laughs> I'm here. Yes, let me get myself sorted out. So there we go. Lovely. No. Okay, so if you are, um, <clears throat> if you are, if this is your very first uh, webinar with the Curious Piano Teachers, the drill is you go find the comment box and you type in and you let us know whereabouts in the world you are listening from today. So um, I know Sally is going to be looking after the comments today. So Sally, are you able to, um, to see those? Yes, I'm just, okay. So everybody, the other thing you need to just do is make sure that you are chatting to all panelists and attendees um so just change it that's it uh trouble is you can't always see their names so i can see that lisbeth is there and vicky is there and um somebody else from kingsport i think it might be lee hello lee yes lee is there kingsport where is kingsport lee tn tn it's somewhere in the states. I'm pretty sure. You're, you're in the states, which is why we're we're, we're scratching our heads because we're we know Ohio. We know OH is Ohio. Vicky is in Leeds. Jill from Bristol, Eastern Tennessee. Okay, thank you very much, Lee. Lovely. Welcome. Um, and I know we've got some more people. So we've got Sarah Jane coming from West Somerset, um, and people flooding in thick and fast, which is fantastic. Great, great, great. Lovely to to have you all here i have to say i'm really excited because i said to sharon this morning i said do you know i've never met june <laughs> so june and i have just said hello a few minutes before we started the webinar so um it is lovely that uh, to meet you at last june because we've sent emails and we've we you know we've we've chatted before but not live so that's really <laughs> really, really exciting Okay, so I think that's probably all we've got at the moment coming in and saying hello to us. Do, if you are still coming online, then do just jot down where it is you are and, uh, and say hello to everybody. But I'm just going to hand back over to Sharon. Lovely. I think what I'm going to do at this point is I'm just going to ask people what you can see. You should be able to see a split screen at the minute. So um, June and I should be on this screen and then Sally should be on the other screen. So I just want to check that that what we're seeing is what you're seeing as well. So if someone can just type into the comments box and confirm that. Um, okay, Vicky says I can only see one screen at a time. At the minute, Vicky, is that just the screen um, that June and I are on? If so, that's good. I think it's probably flicking across. <clears throat> that's the screen that matters. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you can't see me. You're not missing a lot. That's perfect. Lovely. Okay, well, it is just, it has just gone four o'clock. Um, you'll notice that we came on a little bit earlier today just to say hello and to give June all the time uh, that she needs because I know that she has got so, so much to share with you guys. Um, I know that June is really no stranger to, um, to any of you. Um, June, you started composing how long ago? Um, the first piece I wrote for the piano was in 2008. 2004 and then I didn't write anything for another five years um, so had you got something published no the first yeah. books were published at the end of 2011 so and of course she I haven't is. been at it very long 
And I think what's really quite amazing is that you are known by so many people. Um, I know that certainly within the community, um, there is a lot of excitement about your about your books and about your compositions, which are very imaginative um, and and very lovely to teach. Why, thank you. So, <laughs> without further ado, um, Jane, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm thank just going to check that the screen is where everyone can see because Jane is going to be demonstrating as well. So. Um, if you can just give us a thumbs up that you can yep. see that. That looks good, Sharon. Okay. Yep. Lovely, Jim. Thank you very much, Over Sharon. Thank you very much, Sally. And lovely to meet you at last. And uh, just say how lovely it is to be here and how hard I'm trying to imagine that there are other people listening to this, but I know you're all out there and all over the world, which is quite amazing. So uh, I'm absolutely delighted to do this. Now, I'm going to start off talking about some of uh, my own pieces that I have taught to my own pupils and what approaches I take to teaching them. Now, the very first one I'm going to do is a book that perhaps some of you will have come across, which is Toy Box. Um, it's a collection of pre-grade one pieces which uh, try to encapsulate various aspects of different toys. Now the first one I'm going to talk about is the very first piece in the book and I would like to point out that you will see the piano upside down. So when I put on the very top building block it'll be at the bottom. I think we're upside down so we're not worried about that too much. Um, can we see the image of building blocks up on the screen? Yes I'm just going to share the screen. I'm just going to say that you're not upside down oh, from my end. Brilliant. Well, we are Wonderful. Here. Grand. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's, can you everybody see toy, uh, building blocks? This is a very basic piece, but it does introduce a lot of concepts. And it's a piece that I've taught to my niece who didn't play the piano at all. And I've also taught it to my own pupils at a much more advanced level. But it's very good for introducing certain concepts at the piano and if you can all see that we've obviously got the concept of the fifth the fourth the third and the second there and that is repeated three times up the piano uh, it's a pedal down at the beginning keep the pedal down piece the whole way through which children really love doing and so when i was teaching this to my niece who didn't play the piano uh, I just, uh, she just walked up the piano, I showed her the first two notes, which, and we counted up the five notes. And then we looked for the next note up and we counted four notes. So she, uh, do you want to take the, the uh, thing away? Yeah, yes. I'll stop. So she would have used any fingers that came to hand, then we had three, and then we had, we had two, and that's absolutely fine. And I would have held the pedal down for her. Now the whole point of building blocks is as we go up the piano with the fifth fourth, then you repeat that. When you get to the top, the last building block needs to be placed extremely carefully so that you don't knock the tower down. And that placing, that phrasing is it's, it's like the, the end of Chopin Nocturne, that you're going to place that note exactly. At, at the, the very, very carefully. So, so that's even another concept coming into this. And at a more advanced level with my own pupils, we would have uh, worked on our wrists so that we were going to drop in and return the wrist when we're playing each of the two note chords and also used appropriate fingerings. So for the third, we would use two and four. And then for the second, we'd use three and two, and one and one. So we're thinking about how we produce the sound as well. And uh, so that's really building box. Um, shall we move on to uh, Slinky? Mm -hmm. And this is also in Toy Box. And I taught this recently to a young man, and he had great fun with it. Now, there are quite a few challenges within Slinky. 
And what I didn't say about toy box, uh, or not toy box, about building blocks, also applies to Slinky. I have made no effort to make this readable. There's no way a child is going to read those notes. I think you'll agree. And that was on purpose so that they can see the whole scope of the piano. They don't need to read the notes because it, again, it's a rote piece. And I will be coming on to the value of using rote. Now, when I started writing Toy Box and some of the pieces are rote pieces, it was not a deliberate ploy that I'm, I'm going to introduce rote. I, it really wasn't until I read a review of Safari that uh, I realized I had used as many rote pieces as I do. To me, it was just a simple method of accessing the entire keyboard, creating wonderful songs, and yes, it was rote, but rote that can be used to actually accelerate the reading process. So the young man that I taught this to, um, the, the, there are two issues here. There's the repeated note. So we would work on that on the, the lid of the piano and getting good action. Then we'd do it with each finger in turn. And the little finger, because most children would like to play this with the little finger, which is not the finger you would think to use, but that's because we're going to come off that finger. So if you use your third finger, which is a natural one, you would have to shift the hand. And most children prefer to be on the right note before they start that. So even just learning to use the fifth finger in the same way as you would use the third finger for detached notes uh, it is also a useful thing to do as well. So we have this action for the repeated notes, and then we have the scale, which is five notes in each hand. Now, when children start to learn this piece, you will quite often hear, and the notes will clump together. So again, this is an exercise in listening. Can they hear the separation of the notes? And the piece is very easy to play. We start the top note of the piano. Now, I know not all pianos have a B and a C at the top, but you can start on A and you will still end up at uh, the bottom. So it can be played from the C or the A. It sounds better from the C, but it can be managed. So we are going to repeat that. How many times is it? One, five. Then we start on the note below and go down the piano. Now, the young gentleman that I was teaching this to had no problems with any of that, but what he had huge problems with was how many notes to do before he ran down the scale. And sometimes he'd be halfway through the piece and he wouldn't have any left. <laughs> and it was actually a very interesting uh, scenario because he couldn't get his head around the counting. And to cut a long story short, by the time he came to the recital, it was perfect. But we had to decide, was he going to count eight and then start his run down, or was he going to count nine? And that included the start of the run. So he was happy with the nine. So we counted them all and found there were two less each time. So the concept of going, going, going up seven, nine was wonderful, but not backwards which is what he needed to play the piece. So we persevered and eventually the whole thing clicked and he was able to get every single note exactly where it ought to be and perfectly formed. Just one small point about Slinky, if you have anybody teaching that to anybody, do lift the pedal at, before the final one so that it doesn't get very muddy. So if we've come down to here, and then you're just left holding one single. But shall we move on to, I thought I'd talk about a couple of pieces from... Lovely. I'm just going to ask whether or not there are any questions at this point. I know Sally well, well, is looking at that. Yes, there's just yes, one coming so, so far. Um, could you play that last piece as, a, as the whole piece? Could we hear Slinky all the way through? Sure. Yeah. 
Oh, I f thank you, Sally, and thank you, whoever asked the question. I forgot to mention there is another aspect to this acceleration of the, the notes. Uh, of course, we would have talked about the movement of the slinky. I forgot about that. And, and how it, it flips over onto the step, and then it begins to go, and then it flips over. So there's an acceleration of the movement as it goes down each step. And that's what the repeated notes are. As we get to the bottom, it takes less and goes faster. And that's another uh, little teaching point. Um, can I just say that um, the uh, somebody's just said, could you play each piece before talking about them? Oh, well, because that's a very I, good idea. Well, I, yeah. I'll just play building blocks and then we'll move on to the next piece. Thank you, Jim. So we're, we're ready to move on to, and I'm going to talk about uh, some of the teachers, uh, some of the pieces I've taught in Safari. Now, I'm quite devastated because uh, I've only just taken over some very small pupils, and only one of them is on is working on Safari, and she's played half the book already. But I, up until then, I had no opportunity to teach any of these pieces before I published it. Normally, I would have taught them, and they'd have been performed. And uh, but I had nobody to teach it to, but I do now, which is wonderful. So I thought I would start with uh, Flamingo's Feeding, and I will play it first. So, yes, could you leave the piece up on the screen there? And this is a wonderful example of how rote can promote reading. And I taught this piece to a little girl whose reading is, wouldn't be very strong. And so what we did when we approached the piece, we had a look at the left hand and we discovered Oh, joy of joys, the left hand only plays two notes the whole way through. So that's, so we found the notes, F sharp, and then we, the C sharp above that. So we're on the out, bottom of each group of black notes. And they're played separate at the beginning, the low note first, and then together at the end. So we make sure we were happy doing that. And then we looked at the right hand and she would not be able to read in a minor position there at all. So we found the A at the bottom and we looked at the top note of the fifth and the bottom of the note of the fifth, and then the D and the B in bar four or in between. So the notes she's going to need were E at the top, A at the bottom, and then B and skip to D. And doesn't need anything else. So she got herself familiar with that. And before I could say anything, she played the whole piece. Now, she was reading by interval. Uh, no, I've, I've left out, you're saying, oh no, she didn't do line three, and you're absolutely right. I showed her down how to do that first. That we're going to do five one in the left, five one in the right. And then we're moving the right hand down one. So we're playing D and D. So she had a little practice. Oh, I can do that, I can do that. 
and then she read the whole piece right through for me. And then we talked again about the, the reading process. And I, I was actually quite amazed that she could do that. So I think that's where rote helps because it means you're already, already primed to be able to tackle the reading and you're not breaking down the reading in, in the first instance yourself. The hands already are educated and then can perform. So uh, there's a couple of little things, the end of the third and fourth uh, systems there, uh, a little tricky one at the end there when we get to the end of the it's a kind of watery section I and mean, we also of course talked about the flamingos feeding and how delicate they are and stately and they're dabbling in the in the water so when we get to the third system one two three. oh i got that wrong sorry And the right hand then comes in uh, as after a semi breed rather than a minute. So there's a bit of counting has to go on there. And counting and underlying pulse are something I'm going to talk about in a minute as well. So don't let me forget about that because I think that's very important. So should we move on to? Uh, I'd like to quickly show you swallow swooping and if you can see that on the screen. It doesn't look good for a pre-grade one, really. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing I'm going to hop in here and yes. say is there is, of course, a Facebook competition. June is going to be giving away um, a, a, any book. Um, and what you need to do is go on to Sally will put in our um, Facebook page, the, the URL. And what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to, as June goes through these pieces, work out which is your favorite piece and go across to the Facebook page and let us know exactly why it's your favorite piece. And at the end, um, whilst we're still on the call, we're gonna be announcing the winner. So oh. um, if you've got a favorite piece so far, um, I mean, you might want to hold off because I know June has quite a few more pieces still to go, but keep writing down the names and think which one is my favorite. Can I, there are a couple more questions that have come up. Sure. Um, yeah. Shall I ask them now? Yeah. So one from Miriam, um, she's saying she understands the pieces are, and this is particular, I think this is, this came in during to Toy Box. Should, they're not really for true beginners because of the technical element. Are we talking about four to five months of the piano or what, who do you oh. give, who would you give them to June? I, I, well, like, uh, as I said, with building blocks, someone who doesn't play the piano. Uh, and the level of technique that you expect uh, will be dictated by the level of the pupil. Does that answer the question? Okay, yeah, so. Various levels. Obviously, um, you're going to pitch it at, at a, a level that you feel the child is, is capable of the technical requirements. Slinky doesn't need to have technical requirements. You can develop them from it. But if the child just enjoys playing every single key but two on the piano, then why not? Great. Thank you. Hopefully that's, that's answered that, um, Miriam. And um, Liz was also asking, and this might be something that you want to think about as you, as you go on in your answers, but how do you teach a piece like... Um, well, let's say like swallow swooping bar by bar until the whole piece is learned do you teach it all in one lesson or how do you how do you go apart uh, about that yes that's a very good question that's I from liz think mm. that just remind me that i have to answer it i'll talk about yes swooping and then we'll address that question after it did i play the whole of flamingos feeding yes did I? okay yes. Well, i'll play swallow swooping now as i said this doesn't look appetizing to a pre-grade one or a pre-grade one teacher either. <laughs> um, so I'll play it first.
Now, if were you able to see my hands? Oh, of course, you can't answer back. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, we could. Yes, we could. Well, I really only did one thing with my right hand and one thing with the left hand. So this is actually a very easy piece to play. The right hand only plays if the thumb is on G, C, fourth finger, third finger B, and G. And then it goes upside down. And that's all the right hand does. The left hand is sitting in uh, next door in underneath on thumb on F. And again, that's all it does. So just out of that very basic concept, the whole piece is constructed. We move octaves. And when we do the, the, the right hand that goes upwards, the note that the left hand has to play above that is so easy to find because it's the next one. Just the next one on top. The only thing that's a little bit different there is down in bar 12. Going to play the note below the F again, but come up onto the G. And the final chord. We're going to find C and E and play a third. So it's actually very straightforward to play. And if you isolate all those elements and make sure that you're, the child is teaching, it's quite happy doing that and then put it together. And again, the reading, my goodness, the time reading in this is very difficult, very advanced. But by that time, they have heard so much of it and they can then anticipate the sound. They will never be able to read that time, but it will be a guide for them. Now, what was the question I was to answer? So the question is how you would teach it. Uh, in terms the whole of thing or how you would bar, structure it bar bar. well would, how do you teach it in one lesson bar by bar or until uh, sorry bar by bar until the whole piece is learnt or a line at a time uh, i have never taught bar by bar till the whole piece is learnt anything i would never do that um this i would teach that shorthand just the way i've described it we learn to do this we learn to do this, and then we, that's how I would teach it. And then we would start to put it together. And I would teach it by demonstration. Uh, I have to, I'm very lucky, I have two pianos. So the pupil would be sitting over there and I'd say, okay, I'm gonna play the first two bars. Two, three, two, three, and then they copy me. And then I'd play the next two bars and they would copy. And that's how they would put it together, by demonstration and by copying. But only when they have full understanding of what they're doing. I would never teach by rote if they didn't understand what was going on. Does that answer the question, I wonder? Yeah, that, that's really, that's, uh, yeah, that's a really good response. I think really what we're talking about is you're teaching by patterns, aren't you? You're, yeah. you're highlighting the patterns to, to, the, to the pupil and they need to, understand, need to understand those. That's great, really. Um, I've got another question from Nancy who's saying, how do you help the students differentiate uh, the different octaves where, where they happen? Right, that's a good question, isn't it? Um you mean that they can lose track yes. of where they are on the keyboard yeah yes of course they can um yes that's a very good question so Again, can I, can by I... demonstration sally by demonstration and by oral assimilation of the sound yeah yeah and making sure if there is a shift in the middle of the piece for instance um bar nine to ten there we've got to go up the octave that they're aware of where that note is that there is going to be an octave jump there mm. okay that's lovely thank you for that and is it shall i go on to the next piece? i think so is that is that yes. it yes. sally yeah yes yep 
I just want to very briefly touch, and it's going to have to be very brief because I'm looking at the clock here, uh, on, but this is very important. Uh, another piece from Safari, which is under the acacia tree, and it's the second piece in the book. And it's very deliberately put there because one of the most important things that I think you can teach any child is underlying pulse or groove. And you can hear a piece played absolutely beautifully with wonderful musicality, shall we say, uh, lovely phrasing, perfect notes, and there's no underlying pulse. There's no connection sometimes between one phrase and the next and it will not work. And then you can hear the same piece played with mistakes and maybe not just a bit rough around the edges, but it has underlying pulse and it will connect with the listener much better. And underlying pulse is so important. Now I don't mean counting, uh, I mean feeling a groove. Now, if you look at the first two bars of this, you will see that there's nothing happening on the third and fourth beat. I'll just play the opening of it. Sorry. And once we get to bar three, the pulse is reinstated with the right hand, but we open without it. So, it's very, uh, the, the child, if they're sight reading this and they can handle the notes, will inevitably do. it short almost inevitably so what do we do about making sure that does not happen so I would have the child at the other piano and they go and that and then I would continue doing that when necessary throughout the piece so that they begin to hear that sound and it becomes part of the piece and not one two three four one two it was quite often when children are counting they don't count to the pulse they count the numbers terrific but they don't count to the pulse so that that's something that i feel is terribly terribly important and you'll find that in quite a lot of my pieces that there there is that statement made at the beginning where we've got to think pulse the other thing if sharon would like to be a pupil would you like to be a pupil i will give her one of my uh, wonderful castanets that I brought all the way from Barcelona. This is a frog and this is a mouse and she can choose. Oh, I will go with the mice. You want the mice, right, that's yeah. fine. So what I would do is get the pupil then to fill in the two beats with the... And we would take that in all sorts of different ways and play games with it but always thinking about those empty beats. Right, that's just a little, I just wanted to bring that in because I think it's something very, very important. Now, it's half past. Do you want me to move on to composing or do you want me to do something from Paintbox? Let's go something from Paintbox. Yeah, very quick one from Paintbox then. And I don't know about everyone out there, but I do tend to try and match the content of the pieces to the personality of the child, so especially at the beginning, and especially if I can't really home into what they really like. Some children are very accommodating and you ask them what they want to play and don't mind. Don't mind. Well, I wish you would mind. <laughs> so we're going to have a look at Indigo, which is a very dark piece. Indigo is a very dark colour. And we're thinking of very dark sound here. And I taught this to a, a little uh, pupil of mine who was very serious. And he, he really played it beautifully and he, he got on very well with it. This piece wouldn't be for everybody. I, I, I think uh, you have to be quite serious to play this piece. Uh, and again, it's, it's based on a road concept if we have a look at the chord at the beginning not easy to find but if we take the outside of the three black notes g flat and b flat and c hold so we've got major third and a whole and this major second 
And then if we slide up a semitone, so we're playing G and B and a C sharp. So there's various ways you can uh, describe how to play that. The two black notes and then the white one. The two white notes and then the black one missing out a, black, a white note each time. Or you can, they're very sophisticated. Let's find the major thirds and slide up a semitone. So lots of way, different ways you can approach that. So whenever you are playing the G flat, B flat and C, the left hand is playing E flat minor. And when we're every slide up, we're playing E minor. I'll just play you very briefly a little bit of this. Again, I have put in these missing beats so that the, ch the child needs to continue feeling the pulse. And those really can't be guessed because they sound quite strange if they're random. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave paint box mm -hmm. there, that's great. Now, the other thing I was asked to talk about was my composing process. And I thought maybe the best way of doing this would be to take you through a piece that I'm in the middle of writing. And I can show you how I start writing it and what I do as it evolves. Um, I don't think I could ever teach composition because I, I can't imagine this works for very many people. And it's interesting because I don't know how other people write music. I only know how I do it. And I'm going to tell you how I do it. And I don't advise that anybody tries this at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, I, th I think this is, uh, it's almost embarrassing in a way, the way I write music, because I have nothing in my head, nothing preconceived whatsoever. And um, I sort of imagine that people who write music, it's buzzing around in their heads and they, they, they get it down on the manuscript paper, but that's not how it works for me at all. I think the reason I started to write was because I had a period there where I was dabbling with jazz and I started to improvise. And it is for me a very improvisatory process. So I'm going to take you right through a piece I'm writing for a new book. I've got four new books coming out and I'll tell you a little bit about them at the end of the, uh, the webinar. But this is called Sea World and it's going to come after, it's going to be sort of a development after Safari. And there will be very simple legato pedal pieces in it. So can we see the, the draft again there? So this is how I begin, with a blank piece of manuscript. And I will scribble, because I'm always very, I can't wait to get the notes on the paper. So I scribble the, the treble clef and the bass clef and the bracket. I never bother with key signatures or time signatures. I scribble the title and I sit down. Now, what am I doing now, next? I'm thinking about the, the subject matter. Not all the pieces, as you will see at the end, are. Uh, that I write are programmatic, but a huge amount are, and Sea World will definitely be very programmatic. So I'm thinking about seaweed moving in the water. And that, that's really it. There is nothing in my head. And I just start to play. And is that, June, where you start? So you start with, with that title, yes. as it were. With the title. With, with the idea, the concept, the movements, the whole atmosphere of what it is I'm trying to write about. Yes. So do you actually go back to a time and a place when you were standing, in this case, looking at the at sea seaweed, seaweed? Like I was yesterday. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, not necessarily, sometimes, but okay. not necessarily, no. Okay. No, I have never actually seen a lion sleeping. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there has to be some artistic license. Yes, okay. Never got that close. <laughs> So this is seaweed drifting. So then what happens is this. Mm -hmm. 
and I write it down. And that's the piece. I have the whole piece there. The next thing I usually do is write the end. Now we'll have a little look at what I've got at the end of this. I have no idea what that was, but something like that. Because I always like to know where I'm going, how I'm going to tie the whole thing together. That end will not be used, but I always have that in my mind. So then I would, there's quite a lot on that page. Usually there isn't that much. I would go into the computer and put it onto Sibelius. Now, it would have started off, that page is long gone, then it turned into... Into this next page here, which uh, is elaborated on uh, that. So that's fine, I'm working away on that, but the next day I come in and I sit down to play that, but I don't play that, I play this. different but did you notice what happened there I went from 2-4 into 3-4 and I know I like this much better now the next part in my composing process is that I just keep playing it and keep changing and keep thinking oh I like that I'll do that it's not premeditated it happens at the piano so if I was playing through seaweed if I come in and I like I'm gonna have a look at seaweed and see what I'm going to do with it I will play back from the beginning and then I'll tell you what happens. Now I'm hearing that low C coming next, not the F. And I think, oh. Oh yeah, I like that. So we're now on a low C. And then I'm going to take away the quavers. And I know immediately I'm not going to keep those, therefore out. You're so, curious, that's what it's all about. It's, well, yes. Ooh, what if? Yes. So th they go. Now, the next, we have that up there. Yes, the next, well, so I'm starting at bar 13, and I like this. write it because no small child could play that option. So that's going to have to go and be revamped in some way or other. So I'm constantly evolving, constantly changing, but constantly listening. And quite often I play a wrong note by mistake. You know, I, I miss something and I go, oh wow, I really like that. So it's a critical process and it comes from listening to what I'm playing rather than working it out in my head beforehand. Mm, that's fascinating. Do you ever find it challenging to get the point where you actually say, okay, I'm going to sign off on this. This is no, now definitive. That is not challenging. No. <laughs> uh, the reason why I say I don't think you should do this at all because it is hugely time consuming. And I will play around with anything for as long as it takes and that's a very good point, Sharon, um, of something else I was going to talk about, and that's the architecture of the piece. And it's, when you look at a building, which is beautiful architecture, it's all balanced, everything is in the right place, and if you were to put an extra tar there or something, you would disturb the whole thing. And it's the same with the piece of music. Uh, it has to find that path from the beginning to the end where it's beautifully balanced. You all know if you're building an arch with bricks and there's a, a pre-form and the bricks are all put round and then the final headstone is put in at the top and then you take away the, the mould, 
the bricks will hold their place and they'll be perfectly balanced. And if you lift out one of the bricks, the whole thing will collapse. So it's finding that point where you feel you've created your perfect arch. It's very, very important. And I personally persist at that until I know I'm happy with it. And mm -hmm. I would never let anything go that I didn't feel I had got the the architecture of the journey from the beginning to the end. That's a lovely way of describing it. Mm. Yes, that's a, it's, a, it's a very good point. So I, I'll just go straight on to another piece from SeaWorld, which will give you an idea of the headache that that can give you. This is called Breakers, Atlantic Breakers, I think it will be. Uh, I might just play the whole thing and then tell you why I'm not happy with it. How about that? Is that just the first page? It's just the first page, but that's fine. straightforward and but the that is not I'm not happy with that because of the architecture of it sometimes you will have noticed I would have done weighted at the top another time come straight off so it's getting the balance of when that works to maximum uh, impact or uh, impact that will shape the whole piece. So I will spend quite a lot of time trying to wait on this one. No, I'm not waiting on that one. <laughs> and it is very time consuming, but you, you know exactly, you know when you've got it right, when it's not right yet. So does that answer that one? It does, yes. Um, can, I, can I just say that, uh... Although we're getting the overall sense of the pieces, um, the piano is is going very underwater when it's down low, as as the piano does, folks. It's really difficult to uh, to record a piano successfully without absolutely, you know, the top notch uh, recording equipment. And you can hear, especially with a webinar where we're coming over the the internet. Um, so do 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 obviously adjust yourself. It is it is happening for all of us that uh, the piano is a difficult instrument. Sorry, June. That's fine. Mm. That's fine. And it's, it's quite possible as well that it will, um, we'll be sending out the webinar replay. And I think there's a chance that the replay is actually, it's probably because it's, it's not actually being beamed across. Um, yeah. the internet, it might sound a, a little clearer. So you can look at the replay. Lovely. Okay. So what are we doing for time? Okay, I think, Jim, if we move on to you talking about the, the new the pieces new books. coming. Yes. Um, as I said, there are four new books coming out. Uh, the first one, Alphabet, will sort of come before Toy Box, so it'll be slightly easier, slightly more accessible, more beginnerish, and more C centered pieces. I, I'm going to play you one little piece from that. And it's called Angel. And it's obviously the first piece in the book, A for Angel. There will be 27 pieces in the book, so work that one out. <laughs> So 
So you can see it's just C position, both hands, very, very straightforward piece with the pedal down right through that. And then C World, which I've been working on all summer, is uh, we've just looked at a couple of little pieces in that, and I'll play one more from that. And that it, I don't know what it's going to be called yet, it might be called Hawaiian Beach or Pacific Coral Atoll. Except I was showing to someone the other day and they said, What's a coral atoll? So maybe <laughs> that's not a good choice. from SeaWorld. And then the book that I've been working very hard at all summer and is now finished is quite, I may surprise quite a lot of you, it's six little preludes and fugues. And these have been an absolute delight to write. I love fugues personally and there are very few around that are easily accessible. So these will run from grade two to grade four. And I'm going to play you the first one, which is in C major, Prelude and Fugue One. sent in a question why write preludes and fugues <laughs> no nobody's asked that yet but i'm just very excited that you are writing preludes and fugues because i think they're you know i think fugues are wonderful things and to be able to teach them in a miniature way yes. rather than before you get onto the bark oh, kind of ideas yeah uh, no, so, that, that means how many times do you teach a, a bark fugue to to a pupil and they, they're not getting it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, so I'll ask the question, June, why write a fugue? Because they are so satisfying to play. <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> and it's just a wonderful opportunity for, for you, for two-part writing and for yeah. circle of fifths and sequence and inversion yeah. and all those things that are so satisfying and mm -hmm. largely, I mean, they don't come into an Hawaiian beach, you know, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> there they are, and in all their glory, and wonderful, really wonderful to, to have written. I really enjoyed it. And the last book that's coming out, um, hopefully by the end of the year, is 24, uh, it's the Irish Folk Song Collection for Hal Leonard, and 24 Irish Folk Songs, grades two to four. So I'm going to play you one of those. This is one of my favourite of all Irish folk songs, My Lag and Love. Thank you. 
Mm. What a beautiful thing. Very beautiful. Very beautiful indeed. And here we are on the banks of the lagoon. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have a few a few questions coming in here. Uh, one from Liz: um, Does June use her understanding of major and minor scales, etc., to compose, or do you just play notes that you like and then work out the keys? Yes, the second. <laughs> I had a feeling that was it. Yeah. No, yeah. I would never think in a key. Okay. Yeah. Um, almost let your fingers do the do the talking, really, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, some of them go into really adventurous keys. Oh, okay. So Miriam asks about the fugues. Will you put an analysis there with the fugue? Yes. Great stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. And something I think this is from Julie, and uh, she says, "Do you spend most of your comp do you do most of your composing during the summer when you have more time, or do you spread it out over the year?" I thought she, she, the way you phrased that, she was going to say, do you spend most of your time composing? Um, <laughs> I, know, I, I have to do it during the summer. Yeah. Very little time over the rest of the year. Even if you have the time, what mm. you need is space. You need yeah. to come in one day after the next day after the next day to really mm. get things moving. If it's Tuesday morning here and a Friday afternoon, yeah. it, it yeah. doesn't work the same. You can do lots of... Um, editing and uh, fine tuning in that space but the actual creative process you need mm. a lot of time and you need uninterrupted time okay yeah uh, we know we know the feeling actually sharon don't we yeah we do <laughs> you, need, you need space don't you to to be creative to think sort of really yes. really uh, really widely you need space of time yeah so, so okay. I'm lucky i've had four complete weeks this summer mm. Okay. Yeah, nothing but probably post. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think there, I'm just yes. If, I've if got back on because I know that you are going to to chat a little bit. Yes, uh, I will do. But I've got I have got another good question I'd like to ask from Liz, um, and Liz is asking, um, do you teach? The, your pupils by to play these pieces by rote only at the lesson or do you expect how do you expect them to practice this at uh, home and remember it yes that's a good question uh, if they can't uh, you mean do i send videos with them yes yeah i think that's kind of part of it yeah, yeah that would be great thing to do i haven't got myself quite that um technically organized yet uh, if they don't remember, it doesn't matter when they come back. It's not really an issue. They'll have lots of other stuff to do as well. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't give them, you know, the whole bulk of what they had to do that week was something that we just sort of looked at and then they weren't going to remember. Mm. It would be a small part of the lesson. Mm -hmm. And yep. then if they can't manage it, it doesn't matter. We just reinforce it the next week and hopefully get it from there. Okay. I'll, I'll just share with people what I was doing because I was using one of one of June's piece. I, I was using uh, baboons playing. Actually, it was, yeah. and all all my pupils. I've given them a um, piano challenge. Let's say over the over the summer holiday, and one of them was that they had to get parents to email me with a secret code called "I am a pianist." When it got to August, so the thing was, I hadn't prepared it in July. Um, so the parents had to email me at the beginning of the August with this secret code: "I'm a pianist" for the challenge to be released. And the challenge is to learn how to play baboons playing by by rote, by me teaching them via uh, ha having broken the piece down. And I've been filming it in tiny little s segments. And then I'll be sending that through via Notemaker to to the pupils, so they can watch it in their own time, in their own space, and they can watch me teach them how to do it. And then they've got to work out some of it as well. So um, we'll see what they <laughs> we'll see what they come back with. I think it'll be quite interesting. <laughs> um, 
june thank you so much we've got lots and lots of people coming in and saying thank you and um i love this one actually that somebody says it's amazing to me that i'm sitting here in vermont on a beautiful summer's day and being able to participate in this from the other side of the world thank you june wonderful music and it indeed it is it is really very very special i think your music because it's so atmospheric it's so pianistic and it's so satisfying for pupils to play and for us as as, as teachers to teach um, and it's a joy to hear it you know that to know that it all comes from your own practical experience and that you are deeply rooted in your own piano teaching and your own pianism as well and uh, I, I think it's it's making a big impact, June. So I'm going to say on behalf of the piano teaching community, you know, a big, big thank you for for doing what you're doing. I'm getting so excited about um, all these new pieces that are coming coming along. Um, so thank you so much because it is really very, very special music. Um, now I know there've been a few a few queries as as we've gone along the. Um, along the webinar today about people when they've been going along to the curiosity to the um, curious piano teachers page it is the page you need to go to rather than our group we do have a group um, but that is a closed group it is just for people who are in what we call the curious community and that is a subscription um, opportunity for anybody and at the moment our doors are shut because we only open our doors certain points in the year but if you're interested in joining us you need to keep a, a lookout on our curious piano teachers page because our doors will be opening on the 28th of August I think that's the right date isn't it Sharon it is yes it is and um there's a lot of exciting stuff here comes sharon she's coming back around the corner there's a lot of exciting stuff that goes on in the uh, in the curiosity lounge as we call it and uh we we love to explore new ideas and a bit like today we're all coming together across the world from vermont and we find that together across the world we are stronger as as a community as a piano teaching profession so we can promote pieces like June's pieces um, and we can explore new ideas together and Sharon and I are always sort of having too, far too many ideas for our own good um, but we're also sharing you know other lovely things that are coming through within the community so if you haven't liked our page yet the curious piano teachers page that I put the link up to before then do go lo along and like it and that way you'll know you'll you'll get a notification when our doors are open on the 28th and they'll be open for just one week and uh, we'll be popping up on uh, Facebook live during that time I have no doubt at all and uh, you'll be able to come in and join us at that point and that will give you access to our curiosity boxes and uh, become really part of our our community and we're really looking forward to our September we're busy planning our September box at the moment which is all about something called the piano framework which helps us to plan our teaching basically you know it's breaking we're going all the way through to the advanced level um, so you'll be able to know exactly what the skills are what the concepts are what the pianistic uh, motivations are what the style and interpretation is uh, you know what each different level of learning the piano consists of and what you need or what you can be is doing your thinking for you what you can be preparing your students for Sharon anything you want to add to that um, I don't think so but what I am going to say is that um, as June here is I have given her the um, she's at the minute scrolling through the, uh, the Facebook comments that you've been putting up I've asked her to pick one winner so she's going to be announcing that in just a couple of minutes fantastic what I'm going to say first of all is um, I'm going to give you a code, Sally, if you can maybe type this into the comments. Yeah. This is a code um, that you can go in and you can order June's books at a 15% discount. Um, and this discount, um, it will run um, certainly for the next couple of days. Uh, it's JA437. So JA437, and you need to order that 
through Manumat. So the website for that is www.manumat.co.uk. And Sally is putting that in. Yeah. Now, um, June is on holiday, um, as are from tomorrow. So, there, if books get sold out um, quite quickly, as they are quite likely to do, it may be just a little while before you receive yours. Um, but certainly go ahead, and um, the code there is JA437. There you go. I've just shared that with all of you. So, you've got Manumat dot co dot uk uh, which is a piano only uh website for everybody and the code is ja437 i think one thing as well that go on sharon you finish yeah, off with language thing say is, if you are a member of the community um you're actually going to get 25 percent off everything um i'm just about to send an email later on this evening through to our members so if you're a member you get 25 percent off and it's something like um, Peter Simpson, who's the guy at Manumat, uh, I, I asked him earlier today, and it's over 750 um, items of piano teaching, books, and resources. So there's a ton of stuff, and you get 25% off everything. Now, obviously, you need to be a member of the community. That will last until the 31st of August, and of course, our doors will open on the 28th of August. So um, if you're wanting to go and do um, a really big shop for, um, <laughs> for things term. Long term. Um, and you're, if you're not yet a member then uh, you might like to just hold off and go in and put your order then when you still will get for a few days until the 31st of August you will get 25% discount. Um, so again if you're listening and you are a member of the community uh, just look out for an email from us later because the uh, the code that you will need for 25% off will be in that email that you'll get later on this evening. Sharon, we've just had a question from Lee. Um, are these available in the USA? I think Peter is shipping to the USA these days, isn't he? But he is. I'm I afraid we don't know the price. Don't know. You'll have to contact Peter for that. Yes. Um, again, what I will be doing is directly after this call, um, I will be sending out the replay um, and I will give you the details there with that as well. And I'll, I'll give you Peter's email as well. So if you want to contact him directly, if you're in the UK, however, if you spend over 15 pounds um, and you're a member, you get shipping for free. Um, if you're not a member, um, when you spend over 25 pounds, shipping is free. So uh, look out what I will say is, whether or not you remember, look out for the email with the, the webinar replay and there will be more information uh, within that. So just, just give me a couple of hours. Um, I'm at Jim's home in Belfast at the moment. I need to get home. <laughs> uh, so um, if you don't have an email within the next hour, don't panic. It will still be on its way. Um, so I think without further ado, Jim, have you got a winner? For I have a winner. Okay. And the winner is? Well... Can I thank you all for the absolutely gorgeous comments you have made and that they're all, I, I just couldn't pick one except for one and that has to go to Aaron Lander. Love all students' pieces. So excited to teach the preludes and fugues. Nothing like that out there. It's beautiful right now for young students. So thank you, Karen, and you will be getting a free book. Lovely. <laughs> I would just like to give a free book to everybody who sent these gorgeous comments. And uh, so I had to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, listen, Karen, all we need you to do is, um, in fact, probably, but I'm trying to think, the best thing we'll do is we will, uh, I will send you a message. Um, I'll send you a private message in just a moment. So look out for that because I will need to get your, um, your details. And um, we also would like you to let, let us know what book you would like because Jin is um, is going to send you whatever book you would like. So again, if you just have a look onto her website, um, Sally, I don't think we've actually shared that just yet. Um, no, we haven't. But and this goes back to something that I was saying earlier that um, you can also buy um, get studio licenses, can't you, June, for yes. for the books? And and I I absolutely love that that ability to to uh, to get to buy the studio license. So if you're in the USA, that's that's or not in the UK, that's another opportunity, you know. And and there it is. So your your website, June, is www.junearmstrong.com. Yeah. 
Armstrong.com. Yes, I, go, I ship all over the world as well. Yes, yeah. There all we go. If you are buying from uh, Europe or, or worldwide, I will send you an, an instant temporary digital copy to keep you going. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm afraid so I can't do it now because I'm, I'm straight off to Canada for three weeks. <laughs> Yes, if there is a slight delay in you getting something, it means that um, I'm not back from Canada. Yes, and <laughs> your mat has completely run out of Dolphin stock, <laughs> so we will follow it with you in due course. Well, can, I, can I thank Sally and Sharon so much for hosting this? It's been an absolute delight, and I've loved talking to you all all over the world. I um, think Jim, the pleasure has definitely been ours. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. You obviously could have a whole uh, uh, presentation going on because uh, Juanita says, where in Canada are you visiting? Is it a holiday or will you be presenting? No, I won't be presenting. You're I'm on holiday, I think. Mean, present. Just ask. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll do a curious tour out there. Um, but no, thank, thank you so much, June. The pleasure is indeed all, all ours. So thank you to everybody for coming. We are having another webinar next uh, with Heather Hammond and Karen Marshall next week, aren't we, uh, Sharon? So there'll be emails coming out and look out on the Facebook page for that. Um, so hope to see some of you next Tuesday. I think it's next Tuesday, yes, um, for that. So I'm just going to say thank you again to June. Fantastic webinar. Loved every moment of it need to go back and play some more June Armstrong pieces and um, hand over to Sharon to finish off. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and again, just another huge thank you, June. We really appreciate you giving up your time to, uh, to be with us in this webinar today. And um, again, if you are, if you are listening um, today and you are new to June's music, um, do go across to her website. The other great thing is that she has recorded everything everything mm -hmm. everything and it's you can listen mm -hmm. um so do go over check out her website um and look out within the next um let's say four to five hours we will be sending you an email with a link to the replay and um those coupon codes again so once again thank you so much for joining us today um and wherever you are in the world um enjoy the rest of your day and see you on a curious piano teachers webinar very very soon bye for now